Hi everyone, I'm Daryl Heath with the UAL College of Arts, Letters and Sciences. Welcome to the night sky. If you pay any attention at all to the sky, then you'll have no doubt noticed that it's always in motion, always changing. As one season gives way to another, we see a given set of constellations disappear only to be replaced by others. And from night to night, we see stars rise in the east, move across the sky, and then set in the west. Of course, all this apparent motion is due to the earth moving and not the stars. The seasonal changes in our sky occur because the earth is orbiting the sun, and the nightly motions are due to the earth's spin upon its axis. But here in the northern hemisphere, we can see a section of the sky that, while always in motion, in some ways stays pretty much the same. Now a quick way to see this is to look at time-lapse photos or videos that show star trails. A star trail is a long exposure photograph of stars that captures the apparent motion of the sky in the form of long streaks of starlight. Facing towards the south, we see the stars appear to rise in the east and then travel in great arcs across the sky before finally setting in the west. However, looking towards our northern sky, we see the trails form a set of concentric circles of starlight. These stars never rise or set as seen from middle northern latitudes, and we refer to them as being circumpolar. The southern hemisphere has its own set of circumpolar stars that never rise or set as well. If you happen to be directly at either the north or the south pole, then all the stars you see at night are circumpolar. Standing along the equator, and there's no such things as circumpolar stars in your sky. It's only in the mid-latitudes that you have a group of stars that never rise or never set. In this episode of the Night Sky, we're going to look at the Northern Hemisphere's most famous and most important circumpolar stars, and they reside in the constellations of the Big and Little Bears, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. But you might know them better as the Big and Little Dipper. Aside from the Big and Little Bear, other Northern Hemisphere circumpolar constellations include Cassiopeia, the vain queen of Greek mythology, her husband, Cepheus, Draco, the dragon, and the little known and quite faint Camelopardalis, which is said to be a giraffe and was first introduced in the 1600s by a Dutch theologian for, well, reasons that still elude most of us. While well, everyone knows the Big Dipper and Little Dipper, what you may not know is that they're not official constellations. They're called asterisms. These are unofficial star patterns formed from the stars found in one or more of the constellations that are officially designated by the International Astronomical Union, the governing body in astronomy when it comes to standardizing the names of things in the night sky. Now, while you and I see a dipper when we look at these stars, not everyone else does. In Ireland and the United Kingdom, these stars are seen as a plow, while in northern England, some folks recognize it as a cleaver. Throughout the British Isles and parts of Western Europe, other people see a wagon or wain. This has an old tradition that goes as far back as Norse legend, with Scandinavian people referring to it as Odin's wain. In Chinese sky lore, we see a celestial bureaucrat and a cart being followed by two loyal petitioners, while in Burma, other folks look up and see a giant prawn in the heavens. According to Greek mythology, the big bear was once a beautiful woman named Callisto, who catches the eye of the king of the gods himself, Zeus. From their union comes a baby boy named Arcus. But Zeus's wife, Hera, finds out about her husband's indiscretion, and in a fit of jealous rage, she changes Callisto into a bear. Years later, Callisto, while roaming the forest in her bear form, sees a young man armed with a bow and arrow, hunting in her part of the woods. She recognizes the youth as her own son, Arcus, and she raises up on her hind legs and walks toward him with her arms spread wide to embrace him. Arcus only sees a large ferocious bear coming towards him, and he notches his bow and fires off an arrow at the bear. Now fortunately, Zeus sees what's happening, and he stops the arrow in mid-flight. Once Zeus explains the situation, Arcus demands that his mother be turned back into a human once more. Unfortunately, Zeus cannot undo Hera's magic, and to protect mother and son, he transforms Arcus into a bear as well. Seizing the bears by their tails, he slings them around and around, and then hurls them into the sky, 
where they can live out the rest of their lives among the stars. Now, when you sling a bear by the tail into the sky, something must give. And this explains why it is that when you look at depictions of Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, you'll notice that both bears have very long tails and not the short stubby ones that we see in all other bears. Now, Hera was still not happy about things, so she arranged it that while the bears circle around the sky, they would never be able to refresh themselves by swimming in the oceans of the earth. This part of the story explains why it is that for most parts of the Northern Hemisphere, we never see the bears dip below the horizon. Ursa Major, the big bear, is the third largest constellation in our sky, occupying some 1,280 square degrees upon the sky. That's about the size of two full hand widths held out at arm's length. It is one of the original 48 constellations described by Greek astronomer Ptolemy back in the second century AD and is even referred to in Homer's The Odyssey and the Bible. But some scholars think that the origins of Ursa Major go as far back as 50,000 years when various bear cults were thought to have existed among different Paleolithic cultures from around the Northern Hemisphere. Curiously, there have been other cultures widely separated from the ancient Greeks in both time and location who also saw a bear in this part of the sky. The Mi'kmaq Indians of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, along with many other Native American cultures, also saw a bear in the pattern of stars we call the Big Dipper. The Mi'kmaq, like many other people whose lives are intimately tied with nature, noticed that the great celestial bear traveled around the sky in circles each night, and that its orientation upon the sky was also determined by the seasons. For example, during the spring, the Bear Dipper is high up in the sky, but during the fall, it's very low upon our horizon. During the summer and winter, it's placed intermediately upon the sky. To explain the seasonal wanderings of the celestial bear and how it's related to seasonal changes in nature, the Mi'kmaq have a story that uses a hunt as a metaphor. According to Mi'kmaq tradition, the four stars in the bowl of the dipper represents the bear, while the three stars of the dipper's handle are the hunters. But these aren't human hunters, they're three birds, the star closest to the handle is Robin. The middle star is Chickadee, while Moosebird, otherwise known as the Gray Jay, brings up the rear. Our story begins in the springtime, when the celestial bear awakes from hibernation and crawls forth from its winter den. The three friends begin their hunt, and finally, by the time fall arrives, they've managed to catch up to the bear. Robin shoots the bear with an arrow, and during the struggle, he gets a lot of blood on his feathers. He shakes most of it off, and it falls to the earth, only to stain the fall foliage with red. Try as he might, Robin cannot get rid of the red that stains his breast. The bear dies from its wound, and the three friends cook the bear in a great pot. As the fat bubbles over the sides of the pot, it too falls from the sky and stains the leaves yellow. By winter, the skeleton of the bear lies upon its back in the sky, but the spirit of the bear now inhabits the body of another bear. And when it wakes up and leaves its den, the hunt's going to begin all over again. The constellation of Ursa Major is made up of about 20 stars, but there are only seven that you'll be able to see from most city locations, and they make up the asterism of the Big Dipper. Three stars for the handle, four for the bowl. Starting with the tip of the handle and working our way inwards, the names of these stars are Alcade, Mizar, and Alioth. The bowl star's names are Migres, Vecta, sometimes known as Fad, Dubby, and Mirac. The stars in most constellations and asterisms are physically unrelated to one another, but not so with the stars of the Big Dipper. Except for Alcade and Dubby, the stars that form the Dipper are part of an open star cluster that are all loosely joined together by gravity. This assemblage of stars is known as the Ursa Major Moving Group and contains a total of 14 stars, 13 of which are found in Ursa Major. Stars are formed in litters or clusters within vast clouds of hydrogen gas and dust. Given time, they slowly disperse from their nurseries and spread themselves out amongst the galaxy. This is a very slow process. The stars that make up the Ursa Major Moving Group all formed about 300 million years ago, 
At that time, the planet Earth was dominated by two supercontinents, and the early reptiles were just beginning to diversify into the ancestral lines that would give rise to turtles, lizards and snakes, dinosaurs, and the mammals. If you come back in another 100,000 years, the Big Dipper will still look much the same, but with some noticeable differences. Go out some night and take a good look at Mizar, the middle star in the handle of the Big Dipper. Do you see just one star or two? Well, unless your skies are badly light polluted or you just have terrible vision, you should see that Mizar has a faint companion right next to it. This is Alcor, and to the ancient Arabs, Mizar and Alcor were collectively referred to as the horse and rider, and being able to split the two easily was said to be a test of just how good your vision was. Oh, and remember that pot the birds used to cook the bear in in that story from the Micmac? It was being carried by Chickadee, and Chickadee corresponds to the star Mizar, while Alcor is the pot he was assigned to carry during the hunt. Mizar and Alcor were long thought to be optical binaries. That's two stars that just appear close together by line of sight and not physically related to one another. But we now know that they are indeed connected gravitationally to one another. What's more, this isn't just a binary system. With a small backyard telescope, you can see a third star in this group. But wait, there's even more. In recent years, astronomers have determined that Mizar has two unseen companions, while Alcor has one, making the Mizar-Alcor Association a sextuplet system of stars. Now that I've got you outside looking at Mizar and Alcor, I want you to now turn your gaze to the two stars making up the front of the bowl, Mirac and Dubby. These two are known as the pointer stars, and they can lead us to the star Polaris the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper, and the tip of the tail in the Little Bear in the constellation of Ursa Minor. With your mind's eye, draw an imaginary line in between the two pointer stars and extend it for about five times the Mirac W distance, and you will come upon Polaris. Polaris is one of the most famous stars in our night sky because it marks where the North Celestial Pole is upon the dome of the sky. The pivot point around which all the other circumpolar stars seem to rotate. And it points our way north, should we ever get lost, hence the name, the North Star. Being such an important star in our sky, many people think that it's also the brightest. But sadly, this just isn't the case. Polaris is not even in the top 10 list of brightest stars, nor will you find it among the top 20 or even the top 40. Nope, Polaris comes in at number 46, among the brightest stars in our night sky with a magnitude of plus two. Polaris has been assisting mariners and lost travelers for time immemorial by not only pointing them northwards, but also by telling them their latitude upon the globe. And yes, the altitude of Polaris upon your sky also corresponds to your latitude. For example, if you're standing at the North Pole at a latitude of 90 degrees, then Polaris is directly overhead 90 degrees relative to your horizon. Standing here in Little Rock, you are at 35 degrees north latitude, while Polaris is positioned at 35 degrees upon the sky relative to the horizon. Now, one of my favorite stories about how the Big Dipper and Polaris have been used to aid travelers comes to us from the American Civil War. According to the story, there was a mysterious figure in the Underground Railroad known as Peg Leg Joe, who had a song known as Follow the Drinking Gourd that he taught to various people and then was then disseminated among slaves in the South. The drinking gourd, of course, is the Big Dipper, and the lyrics of the song are a very clever code that points out various topographical and celestial landmarks that could lead slaves in Mobile, Alabama northwards and eventually to freedom. The Dipper has meant many things to many people throughout history, but as a symbol of freedom from slavery and tyranny, is perhaps my favorite of all. So until we meet again, I urge you to visit our website for more astronomy content. And as always, please take a little bit of time, step outside and look up in both awe and wonder.